G'day YouTube, Warbles on a lot here. And I'm shooting this on January the 26th, which is also known as Invasion Day. And uh, Invasion Day commemorates the 26th of January 1788 when Governor Arthur Phillip arrived in Botany Bay with his first fleet of colonists from Great Britain. And there are people who think that it's a a day worthy of celebration. There are other people who think it's a day worthy of um, grieving and remembering the losses. I tend to fall into the black armband rather than the white blindfold view. And I thought it might be a really good day, seeing as it is Invasion Day, to commence a book reading. Would you like to hear a book reading? Would you? Would you like to hear a book reading about Australia's darkest hour? That's what it's called, Darwin 1942, Australia's Darkest Hour. Before we get into it, we'll read the back cover. On Wednesday 19th of February 1942, the Japanese Air Force bombed Darwin. This fact is known to most Australians, but very few know exactly what happened. The War Cabinet immediately ordered a news blackout, and the propaganda they released at the time has since become part of our verbal history. But the sequence of events in Darwin that day certainly did not reflect the military honour that the War Cabinet wished us to believe. On the contrary, for what really happened was a combination of chaos, panic, and in many cases, cowardice on an unprecedented scale. During that day, most of the RAAF, Royal Australian Air Farce, ran into the bush and took days to round up. One man even turned up in Melbourne. And after the raid, the city was looted by the provosts, the very people who were supposed to be protecting the property of those who had been evacuated. Timothy Hall is the first writer to be given access to all the official reports of the time. As a result, he's been able to reveal exactly what happened on that dreadful day, a day which Sir Paul Hasluck, Governor-General of Australia, has later described as a day of national shame. Let's see if we can put the record straight. What do you reckon, Feisty? You going to come and listen to this story? First published in 1980 by Methuen Australia Proprietary Limited, 31 Market Street, Sydney, 2000. ISBN 0454-003-293 Acknowledgements I am grateful to many people who contributed their personal recollections of the raid on Darwin and Broome. The photographs were made available by the Australian War Memorial Canberra and the number at the end of each caption is their reference number. I am grateful to them and in particular to Jan Mulqueen who gave me great assistance. Above all, I am greatly indebted to the staff of the Australian Archives uh, and especially Elizabeth Nathan, who spent a great deal of time helping me to track down the information that I hope has shed new light on this vital but largely forgotten chapter in Australia's history. Any interpretation of that information is, of course, mine. Many of the files were previously classified most secret or were restricted in some way. Introduction. The first time in history that Australia was attacked by an enemy is not one from which we can draw much pride. The people in Darwin were neither prepared for an attack that was inevitable nor brave when it came. A hundred Japanese armed with frying pans, an RAAF officer said disgustedly when it was over, could have occupied Australia that day. But if the Japanese raid on Darwin on Thursday 19 February 1942 showed many Australians in their worst light, that is no reason why it should continue to be surrounded by some kind of mystique 40 years later. It was not, after all, merely a few bombs dropped on a country town, but a major bombardment of an important Allied base that left almost 250 people dead and which was carried out by the same task force that only weeks before had devastated Pearl Harbour. There was ample reason for the War Cabinet at the time to suppress the truth about the raids and the way that the Australian servicemen had behaved. Their main concern was to boost Australian morale, not depress it. But what was necessary at the time for the purposes of propaganda all too easily became a part of the folklore. And what was in truth an unqualified disaster has been handed down from one generation to the next as an episode from which Australians can even, in some circuitous way, take pride. Look what Baz Luhrmann did with his 
celluloid fantasy Australia. It is important that the truth be known about an event as significant as the first enemy attack on an Australian target. Maturity in a nation implies that its people can accept the truth about its weaker moments. But it is important for the much more pragmatic reason that we learn from our mistakes. Australia's defence capability and preparedness have never been so much at issue since the end of the Second World War as they are today. Yet it is very difficult to read the extraordinary story of the Japanese attack on Darwin without being left with a very uncomfortable feeling that history might be on the point of repeating itself. Yeah, well, the Indonesian chief of the Air Force said two days ago that their sukhoi's can reach Australia. The budgie smuggling wingnut does seem to desperately want to shoot in war with the Indonesians, so let's look at history. For many years, the transcripts of the Royal Commission convened immediately after the raid to find out what had gone wrong were closed, and many war cabinet files and records of service ministries were not available. Authors and historians have been severely restricted in getting at the truth because they have been denied access to these vital documents. For the first time I had access to them, and it is now only too clear why successive governments have refused to make them available for almost 40 years. The first thing any government does when faced with a war crisis is to manipulate the truth by taking control of the news. Sound familiar? We're only going to have a briefing once a week about the refugee boats and now we're not going to have a briefing even weekly. It did it at Darwin after the raid and pleaded the expedience of war. It has done it ever since because the truth is very unpalatable. Turning the boats back. On the broad canvas of the war in the Pacific, still less the war being waged in Europe and everywhere, the attacks on Darwin and later on the Northern Territory and Western Australia were hardly more than a single stroke of the brush. But these attacks were of vital importance not only to those exposed to them, but to all the people of Australia. For perhaps the first time in our history, pig's ass bullshit, Australians were faced with great danger on our own doorstep. Yeah, well, what about 1788? Was that not a day when Australians were faced with great danger on our doorstep? And in that moment all kinds of myths were shattered. We should know what happened, for only in this way can we have any notion of how we will respond if such a crisis arises again. Prologue. On the morning of Sunday 7 December 1941, the Japanese attacked the American Pacific Naval Base at Pearl Harbour in the Hawaiian Islands and in little more than an hour gained control of the North Pacific. They attacked, as they had in their war against Russia in 1904, ahead of the declaration of war. With the American fleet decimated, that's an old word that means one in ten were killed, well I think they actually uh, did a bit more damage than that. Damn it, there's ants in the coffee. <coughs> With the American fleet decimated, the Japanese could now conduct an uninterrupted seaborne evasion, invasion of all the American, British and Dutch territories in the Pacific. Almost simultaneously with the attack on Pearl Harbor, they began landings on, in the Malay Peninsula and the Philippines. On the night of 8th of February, the Japanese launched an attack on Singapore, which was the key to the Southwest Pacific, and on the 15th of February, the defending forces surrendered. Before the fall of Singapore, the Japanese conquests had spread through the Malay Archipelago, and on the 11th of January, the Japanese had landed in Borneo and the Celebes. By mid-February, the Dutch East Indies were within weeks of collapse, and Australia itself was directly threatened. In brackets, so it appeared. Close brackets. When Ambon in the Celebes fell, Darwin for the first time came within range of land-based bombers as well as the carrier-borne aircraft that had caused the destruction at Pearl Harbor. Darwin was now actually inside the battle area and each day brought fresh news of advances by the Japanese until, as the RAAF station commander at Darwin put it, quote, We woke up every morning wondering if this was to be the day. As early as 12 December 1941, the Australian War Cabinet had decided on an immediate evacuation of women, children, the aged and the infirm from Darwin, the only exceptions being nurses and those missionaries who wanted to remain. The original plan was to take the evacuees overland to Alice Springs until it was pointed out that the top of the Territory was in the middle of the wet season and that the road south of Adelaide River was impassable. It was then decided to use ships or aircraft and the Territory's, uh, territory's administrator 
was instructed to have the first batch of evacuees ready to travel south on the Zealandia on about the 19th of December. From then on, there was a steady exodus of refugees in ships of all sizes. State premiers had been alerted to expect the refugees and reacted with fulsome promises of help, tempered in some states. South Australia was warned to expect about 2,000, including, quote, a small number of Australian-born Chinese, unquote. The prospects of the Chinese seemed to bother the South Australians more than the 2,000 Europeans, and Premier Playford sent a cautionary warning to Prime Minister John Curtin, quote, impossible to billet coloured persons with families, unquote. It apparently had little effect. The next day, Playford sent another message, this time in cipher, which told Curtin, quote, recent evacuees arriving in Darwin in Adelaide from northern Australia include large numbers of half-castes. Difficulty being experienced finding suitable quarters for them. Their presence likely to prove source of infection to contacts. Most undesirable further parties half-castes be sent south. Invasion Day. It still had no effect, however, and Playford must have thought that he was being conspired against. Two days later, he sent yet another telegram to the Prime Minister, quote, Regarding half-caste evacuees, advised this morning proposed send another 250. Again, enter strong protest, end quote. He still got them. The problem was finally resolved by the quaintly titled Chief Protector of Aborigines, who arranged, as he reported, quote, for the Aboriginals to be kept well away from Adelaide. His solution was to put them in a camp at Balaclava, 112 kilometres north of the city in the Adelaide Hills. Back in Darwin, the administrator, Charles Abbott, A-B-B-O-T-T. -T, wonder if he's any relation to the wingnut budgie smuggler, was denying that he was exercising a colour bar in selecting only white Australians to go south in an attempt to relieve Playford of his problems. He said that he had given, quote, no instructions as to colour bar as far as the Chinese were concerned, but the government warned me to be careful about the coloured people going south. I therefore encouraged half-castes to go inland out of Darwin, unquote. While the half-castes were being encouraged to walk into the bush, the nuns and children at the Catholic missions on Melville and Bathurst Islands were being evacuated, although very belatedly. The Catholic Church had been very reluctant to agree to any evacuation until the danger of an invasion by the Japanese became imminent. Not one of the five Methodist missions on the Arnhem Land coast or the Anglican missions on the Gulf of Carpentaria or on the Roper River were evacuated, and there was considerable criticism of their decision, which, according to Vincent White, the Assistant Director of Native Affairs, showed, quote, the cavalier fashion in which the missions regard the survival of their charges, unquote. It was hardly an exaggeration because the Japanese had already shown on many of the Pacific Islands which they had occupied that any mission or individual suspected of operating a coast-watching radio station or even of collaborating with the Allies was a legitimate target. The Australian missions would have been guilty on both counts. At this time, a European woman led 90 part Aboriginal children from Croker Island right across Australia on an epic journey of escape that took two months. One of the children died at Owen Pelly, but the remainder, badly sunburned, their feet bleeding and painful, walked and hitched lifts in cattle trucks and military convoys, and survived on goannas and dry biscuits and whatever they could scrounge along the way until they reached Adelaide. The Aboriginal kids had to walk from Darwin to Adelaide, hitchhiking, eating goannas. On the 18th of February, the last plane load of priority refugees whom the government had ordered out urgently two months earlier finally took off. It was certainly not the last of the civilians, however, for more than 3,000 still remained in the town, only a handful of whom were needed for any kind of essential work. In the end, most of the evacuees had gone happily, although the married women were concerned about leaving their husbands and homes behind. Some had wanted to stay in Darwin and face the Japanese beside their husbands, and a few had managed to get themselves employed on essential duties such as nursing or cooking at the hospital. But for most women, together with the children and the disabled, it was evacuation whether they liked it or not. A few of the disabled refused to go quietly, but none objected so violently as old Jack Buskell, who ran a general store called Curio Cottage. Jack was a remarkable man who would probably have been a formidable weapon to turn against the Japanese if ever they landed, but the authorities were having nothing of it. 
He had been bedridden for years, but this in no way prevented him from running his business. He simply had his bed carried into the middle of the shop and traded from there. Customers found what they wanted on the shelves and then took it to Jack on, in his bed, where he wrapped it up and took the money. He had the paper on one side of the bed and the till on the other. To protect his blind side, he had fixed a mirror in front of him so that he could see what was going on behind his back. In the end, Jack had to be almost carried struggling onto the plane that took him south. As the Japanese advanced down the Pacific and through the Dutch East Indies came closer, one of the more unedifying sights in Darwin had been of able-bodied men physically pushing women and children aside to buy for their own use seats that had been earmarked for the evacuees. These men, a large number of whom were migrant workers, took so many of the seats originally allocated to the evacuees that it was more by chance than good management that the women and children had been evacuated by the time the Japanese finally attacked. It was a situation that could never have arisen without the connivance of the civil airlines who received considerably more money from the paying passengers than they did with the Commonwealth Government for the evacuees. The position became so serious that a deputation of senior officials who had been involved in organising the civil defence evacuation plan went to the airlines and pleaded with them to take several pregnant women who were among the refugees waiting to be airlifted to safety. A similar plea to a group of migrant labourers who had just bought seats on the aircraft went completely unheeded. Very brave, very noble, very patriotic, them men and airlines. When the last of the women and children had gone, those left behind had time to wonder, in some cases for the first time, what lay in store for them. The evacuation had brought home to many people, as nothing before had done, the fact that the war was very close indeed. Seldom can a town which had every reason to believe that an enemy attack was imminent have done so little to prepare itself for the onslaught. It was not even as though there had been no alarms since the outbreak of war with Japan. Radio and newspapers had given a daily resume of the progress of the war in the Pacific and on the night of the 11th of December 1941, only four days after Pearl Harbour, the air raid sirens had sounded in earnest for the first time on Australian soil. It had been an oppressively humid night and the sky was black and heavy with storm clouds. At about a quarter to midnight, the patrons in the Star Theatre were watching the climax of a gangster film and for a moment the siren that shattered the quiet could have been that of the police car on the screen. But the truth became quickly apparent and as the lights went up in the theatre, people hurried blinking into the darkened street. Only a light in a shop across the street dimly illuminating a window display of women's underwear broke the otherwise total darkness in the blackout. A soldier resolved this breach of regulations by heaving a brick through the glass and the light went out. The gloomy gambling dens along Chinatown's Kavanagh Street, badly lit at the best of times, were in total darkness and ARP, that's Air Raid Patrol Wardens, patrolled the town, advising people where to go to take cover. Almost nobody had an air raid shelter and as the siren wailed, hundreds of people hurried to the beach to take shelter at the foot of the cliff, where they were plagued by mosquitoes and sand flies. Many had blankets and pillows and were resigned to a long wait before the Japanese finally arrived under the misguided and dangerous impression, as events would show, that they were to begin, would be given ample warning of an impending raid. Only a handful of them had any idea what to expect in a bombing raid, still less what they should do. Their greatest fear was not indeed of an air raid. It was quite easy, after all, to rationalise that bombs always hit the other fellow and never you, but of a Japanese landing. And the inevitable conclusion of that, people were very will willing to believe, was torture and execution. But on that night of that first air raid warning, after an hour spent huddling on the beach, many people began to consider that the Japanese were only slightly more unbearable than the sand flies and mosquitoes. When the all clear finally sounded in the early hours of the next morning, no aircraft of any nationality had even been heard. Darwin's first remark reminder that Australia was at war had been an anticlimax. At two o'clock on the morning of 14 February 1942, in a fine drizzle, a convoy of four merchant ships, three of them American and one Australian, slipped out of Darwin Harbour. On board were 1,800 men, among them pioneers, a group of anti-tank gunners, a detachment from an American field artillery regiment and various special units together with ammunition and explosives, all intended to reinforce Koh Pang in Timor. The merchant ships were escorted by four warships, also a mixture of American and Australian vessels, 
Senior among them was the American heavy cruiser USS Houston, bracket, which later went to the bottom in the Battle of the Java Sea, close bracket, and she was accompanied by an elderly destroyer, the USS Peary, and two Australian sloops, the Swan and the Warrego, which had been on mine sweeping duties. On a calm sea and maintaining strict blackout and wireless silence, the convoy moved silently through the heads and started on the zigzag course that was intended to confuse the Japanese about its eventual destination. Actually, defence against torpedo attack by submarines, but we'll let that pass. Originally, the convoy was supposed to have had air cover, but the aircraft, American P-40 Kitty Hawks, took so long to arrive in Darwin that after waiting for them for two days, the convoy had left without them. Yeah. The Australians used to call the Kitty Hawks Tomorrow Hawks, because they were always going to show up tomorrow. Uh, it had been put to sea by the senior naval officer in Darwin, Captain Edward Thomas, though with a great deal of apprehension. He knew that with the speed the Japanese were pushing down through Southeast Asia and the Dutch East Indies, it was questionable whether Kopang would even be in Allied hands when the convoy got there. And even if it was, it had no landing facilities and could give the convoy no protection while it was unloading. The first night at sea was uneventful, and the rain cleared with the, the dawn. At seven o'clock a stowaway was found, and at ten the men attended a church parade. There was no sign of the enemy. Then suddenly the quiet was shattered by an aircraft alarm, started on the Houston, and taken up by the other ships. Men watched as a lone four-engine flying boat came steadily toward them from the north, circled at a safe distance, and abruptly disappeared. The all clear was sounded and Houston broke radio silence to signal headquarters that the convoy had been spotted. It was half past one before the alarm went again and once more there was just a single aircraft coming in from the north. This time Houston opened fire, the plane dropped a bomb kilometres from the convoy and then it too disappeared over the horizon. All through the afternoon this same unnerving game of cat and mouse went on with Houston firing harmlessly in the direction of a threatening aircraft as the pilot dropped a bomb into the sea a safe distance away. Back in Darwin, Captain Thomas received the message of, that the convoy had been sighted with a feeling of impending disaster. Once it had put to sea, it had passed out of his control and became the responsibility of General Wavell's headquarters in Java, but it seemed suicidal to Thomas that it should be allowed to continue and after consulting with his opposite number in the RAAF, he decided to wait for three hours and if the convoy had not been ordered back, he would send a signal suggesting that this be done. But when he did this, his signal was ignored. Meanwhile, the convoy steamed on through the night and much of the next morning. Then at precisely 11.17, the inevitable happened. The Japanese had simply been waiting to confirm that the convoy was indeed heading for Timor and that it was safely out of range of an unexpected rescue from the air though intelligence had already told them that the Australians had no aircraft, even if they had wanted to send them. They attacked with 35 bombers and 9 flying boats armed with machine guns, and only luck, good seamanship and the difficulty of scoring a direct hit on a fast-moving ship prevented a naval disaster of the first magnitude. Houston steamed away from the rest of the convoy in an attempt to draw the Japanese fire. With fine seamanship, she seemed to turn almost in her own length as she dodged the falling bombs, firing continuously to keep the Japanese aircraft as high as possible. The sheets of fire from her guns, said one eyewitness, quote, were so constant that she seemed to be ablaze the whole time, unquote. Her performance was even more remarkable because she had been sent to sea with one of her gun turrets out of commission. Nevertheless, her fire was so effective that in spite of the violence of the attack, the damage to ships was remarkably light. There were 29 casualties, including one seaman who died later on shore in hospital, but the ships were still afloat and largely undamaged. But the likelihood of another, more intense attack was now certain, and both Peary and Houston were low on ammunition. It was courting disaster to go on, and Houston signalled this to Java. However, they had to sail on for another two hours before at last the order came through, convoy to return to Darwin. Within minutes the ships had turned and were headed back to Darwin. This time there were no diversionary tactics, and Houston led the convoy back to Darwin by the shortest route. The battle had taken place 650 kilometres from Darwin and they were still very exposed. Japanese reconnaissance planes appeared disturbingly on the horizon, and then as suddenly disappeared, but there was no attempt to repeat the attack. Occasionally unseen by the convoy, 
a Japanese submarine poked its periscope above the waves before submerging again. Darwin was the only port the convoy could return to if it was to have the damage repaired quickly and its ammunition replenished, but in Darwin Harbour the convoy would be a more inviting target than it was on the open sea. The ships were a sitting duck and it was known that the anti-aircraft guns at Darwin were feeble and fighters non-existent. On the evening of Wednesday the 18th of February the convoy limped back through the heads into the harbour and the people in Darwin, civilian and servicemen alike, watched from many vantage points. They knew what its return meant. Quote, they know where the bunny is now, unquote, said Captain Thomas ominously, relieved though he was to see the convoy safely back. And, if the, and they'll be here soon enough to finish it off, end quote. On the Esplanade, telephone technicians Red, Reg Ratley and Walter Rowling watched the convoy berthing and Rowling remarked bleakly, quote, What hope have we got with a target like that to attract the Japs? You can't tell me they won't follow them in. End quote. Before another day was passed, he was mortally wounded. And from his home, overlooking the harbour, the administrator, Charles Abbott, knew that a raid was imminent. But in his worst nightmares, he could not have guessed that in its wake he would be discredited Abbott, ridiculed Abbott, and accused of such things as few politicians in Australia have been accused of before or since. Abbott. Guilt by association, Abbott. Maybe all Abbots are like that. All bikies are assholes. Why not all Abbots? All refugees are assholes. Why not all Abbots? After the raid, Prime Minister John Curtin made a public statement in which he said solemnly, quote, in this first battle on Australian soil, it will be a source of pride to the public to know that the armoured forces and the civilians comported themselves with the gallantry that is traditional of people of our stock. Yes, very brave. Invasion day. Guns against spears. But a man who would later be Australian's Governor-General, Sir Paul Hasluck, put it better when, as a Cabinet Minister, he unveiled a plaque to the memory of some 243 people who died in the raid, quote, Today, he said, is the anniversary of a day of national shame. Let's hope this can upload. Ciao.